Welcome everyone to the fifth episode of Signs, Planets, and Stellar Rhythms. My name is Eric Roth, shamanic astrologer. I'm here to talk about the uh, majority of what's going to take place in the month of June, uh, astrologically speaking, and we'll be looking at various uh, major highlights during this time. It won't cover all the things that are taking place in June in depth. Uh, I'll be creating another uh, video in about two to three weeks and uh, highlight some of those those factors, especially the at the end of the month when Mars moves into Aries and um, the continuing theme of the Jupiter, Pluto, and Saturn uh, conjunction that has been uh, going on this whole year and will continue to uh, the rest of the year and especially have a, um, a, a large impact in the in the fall. All right, let's uh, check out the uh, certain um, uh, things that are going to be happening here with this episode. And what I've been doing in these episodes is trying to give everyone a, a understanding of what's really uh, taking place from a shamanic astrology perspective in the sky. And still looking at as well, there's obviously things that, like for example, Pluto that can't be seen with the naked eye, but still are uh, have uh, an influence, if you will, an effect in the way the other planets are, um, uh, how that transmission or that relationship that we have with the planets is influenced. So this particular episode, episode five, we will be having an, uh, an exploration of, the, uh, of June's annular eclipse and the June solstice, uh, that combination of what that means the Mars-Neptune conjunction, Venus and Gemini rising. This is a start of an entirely new cycle, and that particular topic is, is practically an episode, actually more than one episode all by itself. We could do several videos just on that Venus cycle and what it means and all the uh, mythology that is connected to that. And then at the end, the very tail end of the month, uh, there's going to be some highlights about the second Pluto-Jupiter conjunction, continuing the themes of 2020. All right, let's take a moment and take some breaths and have an acknowledgement of a relationship to Mother Earth, Gaia, and the greater patterning of the, of the sky and the relationship to Earth and our own roles in that space, because we are all intimately connected to that relationship, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, it's present in our life. Astrology is symbolic, philosophical, and mythological language, uh, psychological. It's, it's more of a, a poetry emotion than it is uh, you know, a, a modern day science and it helps us navigate and, and provide providing guidance and insights and wisdom in our lives. So we are here today to thank creation, all our relations and the greater patterning of, of the world and the different rhythms that the planets exhibit as we monitor and, and see, observe all that goes on for all days as long as we draw breath on this planet and perhaps future lifetimes as well. Hmm. So as we breathe in deep, we can imagine ourselves connected to earth and the sky at the same time. It is operating within us. Because well, what happens up there has a connection to our own, major connection to our own stories here on this planet. And we give thanks and love to all that is and the blessing that life brings into our lives. So it is. All right, so let's take a little more of a, a look at what's coming up in June of 2020. We see uh, Vesta moving into the sign of cancer beginning June 3rd. 
Venus is rising as a morning star on June 10th in the sign of Gemini. And this is about coming up on the midpoint of Venus's transit through the sign of Gemini all the way until August, early August. Mars and Neptune will have a conjunction on the 13th of June in the sign of Pisces. Mercury stations retrograde, which uh, is not gonna go deeply into that process. I'm just mentioning here because it, this happens three or four times a year. So, but it is part of a two and a half month period in the sign of Cancer. So this is gonna be uh, strongly highlighted and then I may feature this in the next video that I do. But that station retrograde begins on June 17th and uh, won't go direct until July. So we could see that fitting into the sixth episode. Solstice on the 20th, marking summer in the Northern Hemisphere and winter in the Southern. And this at this point is when the annual eclipse, just hours after the solstice takes place, we see this, uh, the ring of fire. And there are uh, many stories that describe what the ring of fire is. And there's uh, um, some videos that uh, Kaylin, astrologer Kaylin Castell made about this uh, ring of fire. There's been other um, uh, diving into that by other astrologers, including Daniel Giamario has talked about this in his uh, webinar series uh, and part of it back in March at, for the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School. And we also have Mars and Aries beginning June 27th. And I may end up uh, doing an entire, entire video on that or uh, simply uh, uh, as, as a major portion of uh, another video in the future. But that is a big time uh, transit because Mars will be spending almost six and a half months in that sign, which is very rare. So let's, let's get on to it. Beginning with the new Venus cycle, June 9th and 10th. In shamanic astrology, we look at the synodic cycles or the cycles of these planets as an experiential process going on under the night sky or under the sky in general and connecting with these planets, meditating with them, um, honoring them in such a way where we're actually observing and bearing witness to what is happening above. It's more than just looking at the natal chart and the natal chart itself uh, only conveys so much information uh, that we can see, but the sky itself, our experience with these planets and signs uh, convey a lot more than what the chart can display. This is a slide I shared in the last episode. Um, this, uh, diving into the sign of Gemini and how much Gemini has been featured in the month of May, continuing on to some degree through in June. So we get to experience more of this Gemini energy, more of this playful Peter Pan imagination coming through, contrarian, being able to get perspective and see things in a different light, you know, showing us maybe a, 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 a wild wisdom, a crazy wisdom that can come through, but it can be uh, most informative and, uh, you know, uh, help us be able to break out of what we were, whatever tension and seriousness that we were experiencing and help us be able to laugh at ourselves and the silliness that we've displayed um, in, in our lives and obviously in, in uh, recent months as well in relation to the, the intensity and the seriousness of this uh, crisis. Um, for further information about this Venus cycle, I do encourage people to uh, hop on to Venus Alchemy um, to uh, dive into that. The Shamanic Astrology Mystery School also has a course that Venus is a part of. As this cycle was originally determined and, and brought forth, uh, uh, or at least understood shamanically through Daniel Giamario. And it's something that I definitely follow. Uh, we're nearing the end of this cycle. So on June 9th and 10th, we begin an entirely new 584 day uh, cycle. And we call that the heliacal rise, rising with the sun. So 10 degrees away, uh, Venus becomes visible. So here is where Venus will be located, uh, still retrograde at this time, uh, for and, and for just about two more weeks afterwards, or just under, 
10, 10, 10 days to about two weeks after that, it'll, it'll finish up its retrograde process. But it's in the Bull constellation near the Pleiades star cluster and Deldebaran. And it, there's very little, uh, as far as longitudinal degree goes, separation from Venus and Aldebaran. So when, for everyone that is able to see this on June 10th, some might be able to see it on the 9th. Uh, some may not be able to see it until the 11th or 12th. But if you're able to see this, you'll see, uh, you may end up seeing Aldebaran, which is a relatively bright star, um, um, although it'll become much more visible in, um, in the latter part of June in the early morning sky just before sunrise. So this is a, a, the bull constellation, not to be confused with the sign of Taurus. This is this, all of these, uh, these, the majority of this constellation sits in the sign of Gemini. Even the Pleiades star cluster is divided at the very edge of the sign boundary of Gemini and Taurus. So when you're able to see these in the sky, you can see the boundary of those two signs, at least at this time in um, Earth's history here. So June 9th is the official 10 degree separation. And the reason we use 10 degrees is that is when Venus can, by the naked eye, uh, be seen more effectively. And some of that has to do with its, uh, in some degree, his, its declination, uh, uh, how much moisture and clouds are in the sky and our horizon line. There's, there's a lot of variables there. But we use a rule of thumb in shamanic astrology uh, as 10 degrees for Venus and Mercury. And I would say Jupiter as well. And then Mars and Saturn, which are a little bit more uh, farther away in that regard or, and dimmer in, its, in their um, that light that we get to see when they're near the sun, we use about a 15 degree orb. And that is to measure on a physical level, you would extend your hand or your arm out and with a closed fist. And that would be um, about 10 degrees from knuckle to knuckle, from one end of the hand, knuckle the other hand. That's, that's roughly, shamanically speaking, about 10 degrees. All right, so let's look at Mars and Pisces. This is something we al I also visited in the last episode, but I wanted to highlight this because in June here, we have a Mars-Neptune conjunction at almost 21 degrees Pisces. And this is uh, between this and the day before where Mars and the moon are in conjunction and all three of them are kind of clustered together. Neptune is not visible to the naked eye, uh, but it's to acknowledge in its presence uh, it's celestial level energy that we experience within ourselves and in our psyche of what Neptune brings to us. And so Mars moving into that space gives it, gives the masculine an ability or a, uh, a an intention to connect um, from a more uh, divine level, a uh, sort of a, an expansion of its spiritual senses, being able to connect into the dream realm, the ether, um, being able to to open up its heart space and have compassion and more empathy, as well as with Neptune, the dissolving of what previously was with Mars, what previously was with the masculine, since Mars represents the masculine in the masculine principle in shamanic astrology, the dissolving of what the you know this is definitely related to the patriarchy, they're definitely related to what was existing before and maybe an opportunity for us to express the masculine in an entirely new way. The Mar There's gonna be a new Mars cycle that's coming up uh, officially in October when Mars and the sun are in opposition, but there's a preview of this when Mars moves into Aries, which is entirely why uh, I wanna reserve that for another time because that is a, a really big topic. Um, even, like I said, the Venus and Gemini thing is also a major topic as well. Um, so I had to split that up into, into a couple of videos. So let's, you know, for Mars, this brings in the masculine to a place of heart vulnerability and spiritual cosmic connection. With Neptune nearby, you know, uh, with the exception of the actual conjunction on uh, June 13th, it's, it's nearly a month where uh, 
uh, or just about a month where Mars and Neptune are together in the, you know, within 10 degrees of each other. So that is uh, really important to recognize the influence that Mars's passage or transit through this sign and how much uh, Neptune brings to the picture of the masculine. And so for those of you that have strong uh, Piscean energy um, and or um, other signs that are in the uh, mutable modality in traditional astrology or in service to spirit in shamanic astrology, Gemini, Sagittarius, and Virgo, you also may have some uh, personal points or planets affected by this transit, uh, maybe uh, in a Neptune cycle uh, or one of the big ones like a Neptune square Neptune cycle. And so Mars is one of those points that comes in that can uh, be another initiator in that process, in that cycle that you're experiencing. So it'll, it'll add in the masculine, add in that um, uh, assertive uh, action oriented energy into a way that's more uh, spiritually directed, uh, you know, heart directed rather than simply in a way that is, um, you know, um, physically reactive and uh, without, um, you might say, uh, empathy or compassion. So this is this also creates a very highly sensitive time in the world. Um, and you know, with Mars had already moved in on May twelfth, we can see. In this is, I, I do believe that there's a part of this connection that's related to what is happening in other parts of the United States uh, and regarding the, the recent situation in Minnesota and Minneapolis um, with that where the, uh, the reactive uh, biased uh, prejudice quality of the masculine came in uh, without heart, without compassion, without empathy. And so we're seeing now um, both the uh, certain violent reactions but we're also seeing the uh, coming out of, of saying, hey, this, this matters. This is something we need. This is a, pour, a outpouring of the heart and outpouring of like, hey, wait a minute. There's something wrong with this picture. Very, very wrong. And we need to uh, connect with that. And so this is maybe part of that combination that's coming out along, along with the, the continuing theme of Saturn and Jupiter and Pluto, you know, providing some... Uh, deep intensity in, in the world right now. So Mars's journey, um, a little more on this. Uh, these are all the dates I covered in the last episode, but I wanna highlight them again because there's a couple of things in, happening in June. Uh, the Moon-Mars conjunction, this is something uh, you'll get to see if you get up um, three and a half to four hours um, before sunrise and or you can even see it, you know, maybe even an hour up to about an hour before sunrise is um, possibly depending on how much, um, you know, what your uh, vantage point is, but Mars is brightening. And so when, Mar when the, the, the moon, which will be past full at that point, conjuncts Mars, it'll be much easier to, to be able to see where it's like a, a, a marker on the on the wheel and the moon can when it comes over certain points in the sky uh, highlights triggers activates these planets and stars as, as it goes by these these uh, these areas so as it transits itself so you'll see mars if you've been following mars in the sky in the morning recently you'll be seeing it's it's noticeably brightening uh, this month in June, and, and that that process will accelerate considerably in September and October, and you'll see a totally different kind of Mars, one that uh, very similar in brightness to what it was in 2018 in the summertime. Mars rises again about three and a half hours, roughly, at the beginning of June to over four hours before sunrise by the end of June, um, uh, and that you'll be able to see Mars in, in the uh, mid-evening sky by mid to late summer, and certainly, uh, and that'll be dominating uh, the evening sky throughout the fall as well, and the part of the winter as well. So let's dive into the annular solar eclipse on the June solstice. Uh, the there, it's the, it sits in the midst of an eclipse season, which happens roughly five and a half to six months. There's an eclipse season that takes place on this planet, solar and lunar eclipses. 
This has a relationship to do with the orbit of the of the moon of the Earth, and uh, the Earth around the sun, and of course its uh, spin and wobble and all the other dynamics that play a role in in the ability for us to uh, see this alignment take place. So June 5th to 6th, depending on where you are in the world, there's a penumbral lunar eclipse taking place, but then it'll be only visible to those with extremely uh, clear skies and uh, with keen eyesight to be able to really detect a very faint shadow. For most people, it's not, it's, you, you can't really notice the difference. So it's, uh, it's, it still counts as an eclipse because it's like in the, you might say the pre-shadow of the, of the shadow of earth as it uh, uh, passes, as the uh, earth comes between uh, the sun and the moon. But the real highlight is on June 21st um, or late in the evening on the 20th on the west coast of the US. There is an annular solar eclipse, not that this takes place every year, but annular is in a ring, uh, a ring of fire in particular. And there are uh, many mythologies, stories about the ring of fire and what that represents mythologically. And I, there's a particular video that Kaylin Costell made uh, uh, recently that I'm gonna link below and share about that. So you can also watch that and, and uh, get additional um, insight, different uh, insight from various cultures and what they, how they experienced uh, this uh, ring of fire. But this particular eclipse takes place at the very center of the galactic edge what we call the solstice point. It's the opposite of the um, December solstice point, which is harkens uh, or, or, or brings in what we call winter here in the north and summer in the southern hemisphere. So it's near exact at the galactic edge or galactic extreme. Uh, I like to use galactic extreme because it's, it's you know, the very farthest reaches of of the galaxy, of the Milky Way galaxy. And this is the first time any solar eclipse has taken place at this particular seasonal point since 2001. And there are connections to that period of time and 9-11 um, and this period of time and the, uh, the, the eclipse seasons. This is something, um, there's been a few uh, researchers that have, have dived into that, Gemini Brett being one of them, an astrologer. Uh, and then, of course, Daniel Giamario uh, as well, and Kaylin Costell has uh, shared uh, her insights too. Uh, there's in that center, and you're gonna, I'm going to show you a picture here in just a moment. Is it sits in the sacred hoop of stars, and Orion is uh, uh, heavily featured along with the bull and the twins uh, constellations, and surround this particular eclipse. Um, the eclipse season itself doesn't end until July 4th and 5th, depending on where you are in the planet, um, with another penumbral lunar eclipse. So again, another one that you can't really see much of, but it's remarkable. This eclipse point is remarkable because it takes place the ex opposite the U.S.'s um, natal sun position. So the, US, the United States, as every, every country has a, a specific birth chart on some level, some are more specific like the U.S. We were able to, you know, a researcher be able to tell the time of when uh, the declaration was signed on July 4th, 1776. So using that date, we can see that this eclipse, the sun will be where the US's, US natal sun uh, will be, and then the moon will be opposite that. So that can be another uh, activation point for uh, the United States Cancer sun, and then the moon will be in Capricorn at that time. So that fullness, that um, uh, opening of uh, our own shadow being placed upon the moon, maybe that'll give us a, a, a connection to maybe open the doors to more, be able to give more and more constructively, compassionately, and ways where it's in more in harmony with, with the Earth Mother and especially uh, the collective humanity and not just for you know, a certain segment or a class or caste of humanity. This is the picture of the um, sacred hoop and the annular eclipse at zero degrees Cancer. So we can see that um, this 
where this eclipse takes place, so for those of you that are on the other side of the planet from where I am, uh, in uh, the, the, the central line will be invisible in Central Africa, the Middle East, Pakistan, India, China, Nepal, and Taiwan. And then those will be able, others will be able to see a partial eclipse uh, on a broader scale, Central Europe, uh, not Europe, uh, Central Asia, much of Africa, Southeast Asia, including Bangladesh and the Philippines, Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand. So all those countries will be able to see at least some elements of the eclipse, uh, but then you have the, the central line. So we can see right here, this uh, black circle, that is the moon covering the sun. And this is just from a picture taken from my uh, it's free software you can download um, called uh, Stellarium. And there's other other software that can do this as well. And there's, a, there's an app version of this too, although I believe the app costs a few dollars to, to download. But this is a really powerful app and, and being able to display future uh, positions and past positions of the planets and stars and the moon and the sun. So we can see this taking place. Now we see Orion here, there we see Betelgeuse also present uh, at 29 degrees Gemini. So it's a fairly much, uh, very much longitudinally speaking in, in line with uh, the uh, annular eclipse at zero degrees Cancer. And Orion has also been called the hunter constellation or the high man, uh, depending on one's perspective. But we can see the hand, the shoulder, arm, and hand reaching up. And it uh, looks like it's holding onto in its palm the eclipse itself, the sun and the moon. So it's really a, a fantastic image. And it's something I had a chance to see from a lunar perspective, a lunar eclipse perspective uh, back in 2010. I'm gonna go into that a little bit here. But this sacred hoop of stars, I, I have an article about this and others have written articles about this. And I'm gonna have a link to my January article specifically, which has also contains other links within that article that you can connect with and read about uh, the sacred hoop of stars and, um, and this particular eclipse. But it is, a, 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 I think, a, a potent activator um, and sits, sits at a place that is about the, the, the area where the area where we call, what we call the silver gate, where souls are coming into, into our solar system, coming into our galaxy mythologically a lot of ancient cultures looked at it as that silver gate and then the galactic center as the golden gate where souls leave and go to uh, the center to be in whatever their next incarnation might be or next world might be in that way. So we can see these various stars play a enormous role in the expression uh, of this hoop and how this hoop uh, was seen by the uh, Lakota people of uh, uh, North America and uh, long, many centuries long before Europeans uh, conquered this land. Okay, this, now this is, I'm not gonna read all of that's here. This is simply capturing a, mo a part of uh, my article that I did uh, back in January. But I, I brought this up so I can show you where the lunar eclipse took place that I got to witness in Arizona. And it's still part of that uh, uh, nodal family, that, that, that border between uh, Gemini Sagittarius and Cancer Capricorn. So we can see this, you know, this taking place and activating this once again. There's a second activation. And then there was one that took place, a, a, a total lunar total solar eclipse back in uh, on June 21st, 2001. And that was also at zero degrees cancer. And there is certainly uh, research that, uh, more research that one can do and how the, the, the conveyance of that energy coming through 19 years later, uh, what we call a metonic cycle, um, uh, where the moon comes back around and we have our, you might say, um, nodal return cycle or the US uh, events, you know, prior, three months prior to 9-11, uh, we're having this 
repeat again. It doesn't mean we're going to have another 9-11 event. It just means that there's some connections there regarding air travel, regarding uh, limits of our freedoms, um, of what we were, you know, we were doing, uh, like, 2019 was a completely different world than it is right now, just as prior to 9-11 was a, a completely different world than after the events of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, that there was so much that changed in uh, how we traveled, uh, how we viewed the world, and in the same, in the same um, skin, this, this event is, has, there's, there's echoes of that. There's like this next stage that's evolving into this place. So uh, I would encourage everyone to look at that article a little bit. I have some additional information in there, um, but also uh, anybody on your own to, to study that if you're interested in studying the, uh, the eclipse seasons and how they uh, connect to what we're experiencing here on this planet. So let's dive in a little bit into Jupiter and Pluto. Um, this is something I'm bringing up um, Yes, it, it is actually, it takes place at the, at the last days of June, and I may share more at that in my next episode, but this, there's, I, I wanted to comment on this because the last time we had, this is the second of three this year in 2020, um, but the first time that this took place was April 4th, and there was a um, enormous deal made of that conjunction. And, and certainly I, I am totally aligned with it, but what was failed to be mentioned in certain circles that they were not sharing that there were other, there were two more of these conjunctions and that Saturn was, was playing an important role in, um, in the conjunction itself. Like Saturn was, had been nearby back in on April 4th. Saturn again is nearby. This is this is part of that overall theme, that dynamic uh, between these three planets. Also, in addition to that, it's more than just knowing that it's there, but if we get opportunities to go out under the night sky and look toward Jupiter, we know that Pluto is very intimately close, not able to see within it without a, a powerful telescope, but Pluto is, is just below the planet Jupiter, a very bright, the uh, second brightest uh, planet that we can see with the naked eye, uh, with the exception of, of uh, during uh, specific times when Mars can be uh, in opposition with the sun, then it, Mars sometimes can be brighter than Jupiter. But it, it, you, you won't be able to miss Jupiter when you know where to look. It's, it's quite bright and getting brighter uh, this month even. So much will be made of this conjunction as well. But we want to realize that this, this, while this is an extremely potent conjunction, it is important to, to see Saturn's role in the expression of this conjunction. The ring planet will only be six degrees away at zero degrees Aquarius. And a um, few days later, it's going to actually slide into, back into the sign of Capricorn and stay there until until the uh, until December, m roughly mid sometime in mid December, December eighteenth, nineteenth, somewhere in that zone, um, along with Jupiter. That's when Jupiter and Saturn will have their only conjunction during the cycle period. But when planets are that close together, and I saw uh, a couple of nights uh, in the morning, actually a couple of mornings, I guess, but still evening time. Um, dark, I was able to see Saturn and Pluto after we had a long period of, of, of clouds and rain up here in Northwest Oregon. So uh, I was really grateful and thankful uh, for being able to have uh, to do a little meditation with Saturn and Jupiter uh, just before uh, turning in for, uh, for the night. So connect with that. Saturn and Jupiter are both easily seen with the naked eye right now um, and will be for the rest of of, of spring and summer, and even into early fall, um, before it a uh, before they start to dim a bit uh, as they uh, as the sun uh, sun's glare overtakes them. But yes, Capricorn and Aquarius, this this cluster of planets, something I've commented on many times and shared more 
about. And I'll be doing more uh, sharing as this, uh, not only because of this crisis that we're experiencing, but learning more about this conjunction, this triple conjunction and what can take place in this kind of situation, what uh, clues and connections and insights we're getting just from looking in the past and being able to see more clearly uh, what the expression of this uh, particular alignment is, is bringing to us, what blessings, what gifts, what uh, cauldron of creation that has been taking place, but also what uh, intensity and challenges and uh, transformations and death and rebirth that we're having to experience at the same time. So we get all of that as well. Um, here is the um, uh, uh, night sky visual. I put Pluto in there just to give people an understanding of its location. Uh, you don't necessarily need to see it with the naked eye or try to see it with a telescope um, to know it's there. Uh, you can uh, certainly monitor its movements on, on various astronomy programs and um, uh, as, as certain uh, places track this particular planet. But we can see this sitting between the goatfish and the archer constellation. We can see the stars that make up this constellation. It's actually in the form of a, of a crossbow, or a, sorry, a compound bow. And we can see it clearly in, in, as part of that teapot shape that is uh, usually recognized by, uh, by star watchers, by especially those that are, are familiar with the constellations. And then we see also Nunki out here representing the uh, sort of the, um, uh, the, the shoulder connecting to the to the neck and head area of the archer itself and the vein of the arrow as it comes through here in this area. So uh, imagine an arrow being pulled back and pointing in, in the direction of galactic center, which is roughly uh, to the left hand, uh, right hand side of the screen here. So another thing to comment that I want to share is I, in my presentations, I like to talk about the night sky. I like to talk about actually where the planets are also in, also as far as in the chart too, that's important, but to actually do observations, to uh, witness this, to be out there and experience it for yourselves. I've always felt, and uh, certainly it was originally taught to me back in the uh, mid 2000s by Daniel Jumario and Kaylin and uh, my own shamanic experiences through uh, various other teachers as well contributed to this, but it is vital for us, I believe, to fully connect with the planets. And the shamans of, uh, of old, uh, throughout the globe, uh, uh, various medicine people, priests, priestesses, druids, many other uh, kinds of, of elders and uh, wizards or, uh, you know, just observers would go out and see the plants. They would connect with it. It was a, it was a, it was a uh, kinesthetic experience rather than just, they didn't have, obviously, have computers then, but they would go out and check and, and have a relationship with it. I found that a lot of astrologers um, have uh, have a very minor or no relationship at all with it. Although I'm seeing a growing number of them opening up and, and being able to co connect with the sky and the moon and the sun, uh, the stars and planets and so forth. So I keep encouraging that to happen because it's part of the, our own education as not just as astrologers, but as human beings in our connection, our relationship with the cosmos. So uh, thank you for uh, watching this. Uh, I love doing these presentations. And uh, as a shamanic astrologer, I've been doing this for now over 10 years. And I do all kinds of readings and classes and events. And I'm, I'm doing a couple of classes this summer, one at the end of June in, uh, at an herbal shop in um, uh, Willow Creek, California, a basic 101 class. And then I'm also doing a sacred destiny workshop at the end of August in Medford, Oregon. It's going to be, they're going to be small groups. So, you know, certainly in this time that we're living in, having small groups is, uh, is perfect. And as we're trying to wake up and, and reconnect with others out in the world and our communities and our friends, uh, these are designed to kind of help us connect with the world and, and others as well by uh, sharing as much as, as possible through 
what the planets bring, what the cosmos shares with me even, and uh, what I've learned from others and, and being able to bring that to, uh, to as many as I can uh, in the, in the, um, within the limits that we are experiencing right now in the world. So again, thank you all for, for being a part of this. And uh, I hope you have uh, uh, an amazing few weeks and uh, dream well out there in the world um, and enjoy enjoy this this is def this li life is a blessing a gift um, and even some of the the most painful moments can be really really powerful teachings um, and i've learned that in my life on numerous occasions thank you all very much